啊，各位老师，大家好 ，Hello everyone，Hello， 大家好，<笑>好，欢迎各位老师来参加今天我们组织的讲座。呃、uh, ，Thanks for everyone, welcome. Um, hello everyone, welcome to attend all of this workshop organized by us. Uh, so the CES, uh, the Chinese.、Uh, Chinese Education Service and also the the,、uh, the Mandarin Companion.、Um, so, welcome to this workshop. 好的，那今天我们大平台请到的是唐伟唐唐伟杰老师啊、呃。唐伟杰老师英文名字是叫 Jerry Turner， 他呢是这个 Mandarin Companion 的创始人之一。呃，今天主要给大家带来的这个讲座，主要是关于我们的 extended reading 和 level reading， 或者叫做 great reading。呃，之前前面呃有几个呃几天之前在 Indiana 的呃讲座里面 ，Dr. Crashen 也特别谈到了关于泛读和分级阅读的一些内容，所以相相信今天呃这个讲座应该会带来给大家带来更多的信息。好的，那么话不多说，下面我们就请。Jared， 呃，请这个唐先生可以开始他今天的讲座。Okay， 好的，谢谢啊。好 ，So hello everyone. Uh, the presentation today is going to be in English. Uh, so I do speak Chinese, but、uh, I'm confident your English is probably better than my Chinese. Um, but we also have a number of attendees who are not、uh, native Chinese speakers as well. Uh, so real quick, I'd like to、uh, in the chat tell us where you're from, where you're teaching,、uh, maybe just you know what state you're from, or even what country you're from. Love to just hear from you、um, before we get going. And we still have a number of people who will be trickling in over the next, I imagine, five to ten minutes. So、um, as as uh, uh, Yulasha he said that、uh, yeah, my name is Jared Turner,、uh, and I am the founder of Man Companion. And we're gonna go ahead and kick in. So we have people from all right, Palo Alto, California. Oh, Jennifer Short, I know you. Good to see you. Not I, Finny. I know you too. Great. Good to see you guys.、Um, Kansas City, Cleveland. How's it going? I'm not sure. Peter, I'm not. Oh wait, you are. Oh, you're in Kazakhstan. That's right. Kazakhstan, yes. <laughs> 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 Washington, California. All right, great. Look, we have people from all over the United States. It's so wonderful to have you guys here and、uh, participating in this webinar. Yeah, even some some country outside the United States too. So that's wonderful. That's right.、Um, all right, I have associate on the back end here. At some point,、uh, we'll probably have a little poll here to、uh, identify where you guys. All right, we have someone from Australia, right from land down under. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and、uh, yeah. Please let us know where you're from. It'd be great.、We'd、love just kind of hear from you.、Um, and I'm going to go ahead and kick into our presentation.、Um, and also, like I said, my associate will be posting a poll on here so we can get a lot idea of who, not just where you're from, but also what kind of program you're teaching in, or even if you're a student or administrator. So we'll have that up hopefully in a few minutes. And I yes, there will be a recording of this.、Um, about within an hour after this presentation, you should receive an email、uh, with a replay of this. And we're also going to put this up on our YouTube page, so that anyone else can go back and look at this. We'll also be handing out some,、uh, do some handouts during this, and、uh, we'll be able to share those in a little bit.、Okay. So, all right, we're going to talk today about graded readers and how to build fluency with students. Uh, specifically for all of you teachers out there, and、uh, oh wait, we have someone from Yingguo. So great, welcome Yingji. All right. So and uh, and uh, Han Xing, he gave a little bit of a background about me.、Um, and so as he had mentioned, I actually went to the University of Utah in the United States.、Uh, I did economics, and I went to Purdue for an MBA. So I don't have a background in education in、uh, in education. But I moved to China in 2010.、Uh, in 2011, I really made some breakthroughs by doing、uh, reading graded readers, and、uh, it spurred me with the idea to start Mandarin Companion the next year.、Um, my kids also went to local Chinese schools in Shanghai when we lived there. I have four kids then, five now. Yeah, just a few kids, and、uh, they went up to fourth grade until we moved back to Utah. 
Uh, also, since I've been back, I have a podcast where I talk about strategies of learning Chinese. There's a, these are particularly um, focused towards people who are learning Chinese as a second language. So any of your students probably would might be interested if they're, you know, uh, at least teenagers should might be able to would be interested in the podcast. So let's kick into this. So we're going to talk about a bunch of things today. First off, oh, Dave, Dave Landis. He's a, he's a longtime Random Companion listener. So thanks to have you, Dave. Um, all right. So have you ever felt this way? As a teacher, ripping your hair out, like I've been teaching these students. They know the rules. Why can't they use them? I spent two weeks on the difference between the two words, and they're still using it wrong. After so many practice readings, their reading speed still so slow. That character in lesson three, I don't remember by lesson four. You know, this is this is a very common thing. And it's even harder for us, for language teachers in Chinese, but just because of the nature of the written language, it's difficult. It is challenging to teach Chinese. So one of the things I first want to touch on here is that oftentimes we run into one of these problems in language education where we have this concept of knowledge versus proficiency. And this is a quote from a teacher. He says, a student may be able to study up to an intermediate level of Chinese, but lack an intermediate level of proficiency. So this is no different than someone reading about how to play the guitar, but not having enough practice to actually practice it. You may be able to read music, may be able to understand all the concepts and the theory, where you should put your hands, how to do different fingerings on a guitar, but not have enough practice and they lack the proficiency. So we're going to talk about like how to get some of that proficiency in some of these problems. So one of the things here about course books, oh, we have someone with uh, some problems. It looks like uh, Larry Murray screen just says, start the broadcast. Uh, Larry, maybe you should try to uh, just reload your browser. If anyone's having that same problem or it's not displaying, maybe just try to reload the browser, go back out and come back in. So shortcomings of course books. All right, course books in general are good at introducing language, but they're not good at recycling the language. A lot of research shows that you need 10 to 30 encounters with a word before you can connect the meaning of that word, the uh, meaning of the word with it, connect to the meaning with the word. So the bottom line is it takes a lot of exposure of a character in order or a word and for it to start like being able to use it. And if it's abstract, it could take 50 or more meetings. Now, and if anyone know Terry Waltz, she's a teacher trainer and she's very uh, talking all about comprehensible input. Uh, we had her on our podcast recently and I pulled this quote. She says, let's look at integrated Chinese. How many vocab words in a chapter? A lot. If you look at how many times each character is seen in print, you might be lucky to get four to five in a chapter. How do you expect someone to learn to read if that's the only opportunity they have to learn to read and they're learning those words at the same time by force of memory? So textbooks are excellent at introducing language, but they haven't been very good at recycling it and actually building enough repetition that you need for proficiency. This is why as teachers, we're trying all these activities, we're trying to do other things in the classroom. So we're gonna talk about how uh, you know, rated readers can solve that. Another question here is about uh, what about maybe we learn a word, maybe we have a flashcard, but this, what about word pairs? About These are also called collocations. Another word is also colligations. So, but for example, wenti, how many different pairings can it have? So we have jue ding wenti, you wenti, mei wenti, wen wenti, hui da wenti, mei you wenti, chu wenti, yu da wenti, chu xian wenti, and the list goes on and on. And this isn't a full list for all of the word pairs with wenti, right? But so how are students going to get the exposure that they need to even acquire a fraction of these word pairs? And this comes to a problem that uh, there's a teacher here, Grant Brown. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to mention him a number of times in this presentation. I wish he could have been here. Um, but he he's experienced, he said, we would study the lessons, uh, learn new vocabulary, take a test and do okay on the test, then move on to the next section. But they know they're not getting better. And you know they're not getting better at Chinese. But what do you do? Um 
Well, here's what we do. And the concept that we're going to talk about today is extensive reading. Now, extensive reading, it's an approach to language learning where learners read as many easy to read books at a high level of comprehension. So you probably know the concept of comprehensible input. Now, extensive reading, it builds on this on uh, Stephen Crash Crashen's uh, hypothesis, uh, in, uh, comprehensible input hypothesis. Uh, and if you know his hypothesis, it says we learn best at R level plus one, or the, his formula is I plus one. Well, the Extensive Reading Foundation, they've done decades of research and they found that plus one. See, that's kind of the debate among language teachers and researchers. What is that plus one? The Extensive Reading Foundation has found that we learn best at a 98% comprehension level. So that plus one is usually about 2%. But you may be saying 98% comprehension, isn't that too easy? 80% should be enough, right? And you see that person there like, hmm, that's my partner, John Pazden with Manor Companion. He's a legend in uh, Chinese. His Chinese might be better than you know, some Chinese teachers. Anyway, uh, so here's what here's a sample text, okay, for reading at 98%. Now, I'm going to, I guess we'll read this together. So, Li Ye de Baba, Jing Chang, Zai Wai Mian, Han Shao Zai Jia. Now, go ahead and keep reading through here, and you're going to come across some characters that simply do not exist. And when you come across that, don't be asking yourself, what does that character just know it doesn't exist? I'm gonna try to uh, underline it here. As you're going through that, this is what it's like to read at a 98% comprehension level. So this is the ideal for extensive reading that we want to be reading at this level. So I'm finally getting my drawings on. So we only have roughly, oh, I should have been reading with you guys. We only roughly have just a couple characters in here that you don't know. And this is what it's like for a learner to read. But let's go on. Let's move on from here. And so let's simulate. I'll have to get rid of that real quick. So now let's simulate what it's like to read at 95%. So Li Ye Jen de Gen Ta de Mama Bu Yang Ta Kan Chi Lai Yo Wa Shama Yo Shama Hai Jin Chang Sheng Bing Ta Zong Shi Shi Huan Sheng Chi Ta Sheng Chi de Shi Ho Zong Shi Shama so go ahead and read through here. And now you can know what it's like for your students to be reading at roughly a 95% level of comprehension. So it's a little harder, but you still kind of get the idea. And I didn't circle all the characters in there, but you get an idea of what it's going to be like for student and it's easy for us to forget what it's like for a new reader to read Chinese all right now let's simulate what it's gonna be like for 80 percent how do you think we're gonna do all right holai top dao mama da ren hua tai na jenda the shang shamala ta jali han duo ren do la Okay, keep reading. This is painful. All right, do you guys have any idea what was really going on in that in that chapter, in this little reading? So this is what it feels like for learners when they are given a text that is just too difficult for them or when there's a lot of characters or words in there that they don't know. It's challenging, it's hard, it's slow, it's demotivating, and the comprehension suffers. If I really, even if I had a dictionary that had these characters in it, and, by, and just so you know, this is an exercise that we do with teachers. 
uh and these characters are like ancient characters we've found like characters that just like nobody knows uh so don't feel bad if you don't know those characters or feel less of a chinese speaker um and so this is a, a wonderful thing for you to to remember what it's like for your students so what we're going to do here is i'm going to talk about the different levels of reading now i've got this in chinese and english so for any uh chinese speakers who feel more comfortable on the chinese side so we have three different levels so the first one we, we, we read at was the 98% comprehension, and that's what we call an extensive reading level. At this level, we are reading fast, fluently, adequate comprehension, it's enjoyable. So this is a comprehensible input level. So it's swift, we're able to read more quickly. Because you're able to read more quickly, you're actually able to read a lot more content. And funny enough, you actually encounter more unknown words, but they're in context and it helps you understand it better. At an intensive level, it's more of an instructional level. This is usually what we find in textbooks, have you know short paragraphs with lots of new words in them. And it's helpful, but it's done best at, um, it's done best at, so if it's guided reading. So you as a teacher helping students through it or having a more experienced uh, reader help that student through the reading. When we start going below 90% comprehension, this is the reading pain level. Now, I am sure all of us have been there, whether your native language is Chinese or English or something else. In learning Chinese or learning English, did you ever come across a, something where your teacher assigned you a paragraph or even a book where it was so hard to read and it took you so slow it took you an hour to read one page think back and how much did you really learn and the answer usually is not a lot it and i will say that for every one person in my experience who does learn this way and has pushed through and it has uh, learned a language by at a breeding pain level there's probably uh, hundreds that dropped out so I would even say the people who learn that way, it's probably not the best example because there's so many people who just stopped. So uh, I'm going to talk about what the benefits are of reading at an extensive level. So the, I usually say there's kind of four key things. One, a lot of the research shows that we can learn vocabulary twice as fast. Two, it, grammar is becomes acquired naturally. Grammar is just simply patterns of language. And when we see the patterns over and over, we just start to acquire those in our brain. Um, a good example is one of my podcasts, I interviewed Stephen Kaufman, and he's kind of a famous internet polyglot. He speaks 20 languages, and he says he never studies grammar. I always bring that story up because it's a good example. He says, I just try to get familiar with the language and try to get a lot of input. Grammar starts to make sense. And it's grammar instruction becomes helpful after you have an understanding to help clarify grammar points. So three, it trains your brain to automatically process the language. So when you get a lot of comprehensible input that you understand, there comes a point where, well, at the beginning, students usually will translate into English. This happens all the time, right? When you're teaching students, you're talking to them, you say something to them, they listen, they stop because they're going to translate what you said into English, and then they're thinking about a response in English, and then translate it back into Chinese. So when you get a lot of comprehensible input, what kind of happens, especially at an extensive reading level, is you, have, you don't have time, you build reading speed, and you don't have time to translate. It helps break that, um, breaks that bad habit, and they learn to understand in Chinese. The fourth thing is that it's actually enjoyable. How many of you have had students who have just wanted to read a textbook for fun or have you ever had a student come into class and say can i start studying right now well i haven't had that happen with a textbook but i have had it happen with graded readers so we're going to talk uh, i'm going to cover three point success stories the first one is uh, grant brown who i've mentioned i'm going to quote him a number of times here we actually wrote an article about him uh, about his experience on our blog and our on our website but it, he's in a chinese teacher in cedar rapids iowa 
So uh, he took his students were pretty much all, like 50% of them were passing the AP chess and they were typically heritage learners. He started implementing extensive reading and activities in the classroom. He took his entire class from, um, to a hundred percent pass rate on the AP Chinese exam with an average score of four. Okay. That is a big deal. And that wasn't with all heritage speakers. And that was all students. Every student in his class took the test and everyone passed. So a significant 100% pass rate. The other one, these are both for English, but still telling. Most of the research for extensive reading is in English. We're trying to spur some more research and papers and academics uh, for Chinese, but that takes some time and we have some papers that should hopefully come out in the next couple of years. Um, there's a private school in Tokyo, Japan. Since they implemented extensive reading uh, almost 20 years ago, their average student scores in the top 2% in the national English, English exam. And even the lowest quartile, like their worst students still perform in the top 20%. So that is a significant impact of extensive reading on, on, um, on language acquisition. Other thing is in uh, Kyoto Sango University. Um, they did a number of academics in Japan, did a study where they implemented an ER program and the students on average scored 37 to 49% higher on the reading section of the entrance uh, English assessment exam. So, and, but the big thing about this too is that there's a lot of things that teachers we struggle with are, um, a lot of things our teachers we struggle with is, you know, getting students motivated, interested and engaged. So we're also gonna really touch on how that helps uh, students, how this helps students like uh, really get involved. Uh, just one point real quick before we move on. If you notice, there is a poll that went out. Um, I appreciate you if you just kind of click on that, let us know uh, what best describes the program you teach in. So we just like to know who's on here so we can speak to you directly and and uh, know what kind of uh, people that we, we have here and I can address things directly to you. All right. Let's see here. So, all right. What we need to do extensive reading is we need graded readers. So these are, um, you know, Fenji Du Wu. And so what are these? Graded readers, they're storybooks that are written for learners at different difficulty levels, or we say grades. So they're not easy to write. Um, I have here, I have a bunch of examples for everyone. So obviously, Manor Companion, uh, these are our graded readers. We have 16 at three different levels. Our level one starts at 150 characters. Our level level one is 300 characters and level two is a 450 character standard. And those characters are the, the characters that a learner is most likely to know. And so they're very easy to read. And we have schools, I imagine, I know we have people, teachers here who have used these with, in the classroom. I also like to mention Terry Waltz, her readers, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, she has some great books. She has some very low level readers with high level of repetition. So you have some readers that only use about 40 characters in them. Uh, there are, there are some of them are really fun and wacky. The Chinese Breeze series is out there. Their level is similar to ours, but their lowest level is a 300 character level. And then uh, as you see on the far right here, I have uh, the Rise of the Monkey King series. Uh, this is a little bit better for um, higher level students. So if you have students who are, you know, they're, they're written for HSK3 level, but if you have students who are more ready for like the AP test, they, if they can read these, they should be doing pretty well on it. Oh, and Sharon asks, it says, um, we do, uh, yes, Sharon, we do offer both traditional and simplified versions of the books. And you have a mixed class. That is a unique challenge, Sharon. Wow. Uh, also, there are online solutions. Um, our books are available on OverDrive. And I think there are some other greater readers that are available on OverDrive. Uh, if your library uses OverDrive, uh, you can get the books there. Also, our books are on Level Chinese. If any of you are familiar with that, Level Chinese also has a lot of online reading materials. Um, all right. So there are a lot of options. We're also going to talk a little bit more about this. Diane, thank you. You have uh, mentioned there are there's a whole bunch of books that Diane Neubauer and uh, Diane, I've worked with her closely on a number of things. Um, how uh, Yan Yu Borch says, how much would it cost to get a class pass? 
Um, for the online, I'm actually not so sure. I, I'm, I'm really, actually, I feel bad. I'm a little unfamiliar with the online options. Um, and also, we our books are available on eBooks. So is Chinese Breeze and the Rise of the Monkey King series. Uh, hopefully working with Terry Waltz that we might be able to help her get her stuff online soon. Um, so that is option for your university or independent class. You can actually have students buy the ebook or the print book, and uh, you can do individual readings that way. Um, oh, and Jennifer Short, uh, she yes, Jennifer, she's been asking for e for audiobooks for quite a while. Good news, we have our breakthrough in level two audiobooks in the works. They should be done in a week or so, and probably be available in the next few weeks. And I'm not necessarily here just to push man or companion. We're, we're here to talk about a whole lot of things. Um, so we'll, get, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, specifically, what is not a graded reader? Okay. Boo, 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 boo. These are not graded readers. Okay. Books for Chinese kids. These are not graded readers. Why? Because they're not written for second language learners. Okay, they're written for native Chinese kids, not for students who are learning Chinese as a second language. Um, if you also note that a lot of the kids' Chinese books, many of them, especially picture books, kids don't read them themselves. S parents or adults read it to the child. And it has, and the child also can speak the language, and now they're learning to read. So they're matching sounds and words with characters. We are L2 learners. They are learning to speak and read at the same time. So the other thing too is books with unscientific level standards. I've seen books that say we have a 150 character standard or a 300 character standard, but that standard, what standard? And in my, and usually what I've seen is they're just books that, you know, uh, they just 300 characters that they thought you know, are, are good, but not necessarily that good. Other thing is pinging over the characters. I've written a whole article about this. Um, I've written a whole article about pinging over characters, and it does not say make it readable. Uh, Chinese kids, and in fact, all you Chinese teachers who are watching this, you know you learn to read characters before you learn pinging. But for native kids, We've learned to the alphabet. We learned English before we learned Chinese. And it's almost impossible for us not to look at the pinyin. And also books that are not long enough to provide sufficient context and repetition. So I have some of these here. Um, you can see short articles in textbooks, why they can be good for intensive reading. They are not extensive reading. It's just not enough input. Once again, you need to ask how much repetition are we really getting in these materials. Uh, Aaron Erie Russell also asks, it says, hey, what about do Chinese with the chairman's bow? Yes, those are actually good programs. I have, I sorry, I didn't mention them. Actually, I remember the chairman's bow right before we were ready to go live. So the chairman's bow is a website and they translate articles and they simplify them. Um, the leveling isn't always the best, but they have helps there. So it can be helpful. Yeah, and Peter, he, Good note, the children's books are often full of weird vocabulary. They're unusual in day-to-day -day life. Yes, so so true. Uh, this about pinging over characters. This is one of the first memes I ever made, uh, but this is so accurate. You just can't not look at the pinging. And so you, you, you just, so it, it doesn't make it readable. And if students, they rely on the pinging to read the characters, then it's probably just too hard. So reading at the right level, we have we have a thing here. So we have the virtuous cycle of the weak reader and virtu vicious cycle of the weak reader and virtuous cycle of the good reader. So if they don't understand, they read slowly, they don't enjoy reading, and they don't read much. But if they understand better, they read faster, they enjoy reading, and they read more. And it keeps going around and around like this. So this is also a problem that if you have students who don't like to read, this is one of the root problems. And now we're all, the question might be like, how can we get leveled materials, right? And this is the essential question uh, for a Chinese teacher is making sure you have materials at the right level. We're gonna get into that even further. Oh, I have some quotes here. I meant to take this slide out. 
but um but uh christine nuttall she says uh what best way to learn a language is to live among the speakers the next best way is to read extensively and ken mogi he also says i forget what his english translation is but anyway there we go so how this is what you guys have been waiting for how to implement extensive reading into the classroom so uh, there are, I have done some pilot classes before and I've worked with a lot of teachers on this. So here are four specific ways to do extensive reading in the classroom. Uh, there's probably other ones if you guys are creative. And especially we have online learning going on right now. So this is also a challenge. So one, the best solution is if you can have an extensive reading class. Not everyone has this luxury, but if you can have a class what is devoted specifically to reading and this is one of the ideal things and you can get so much out of a class that is just focused on extensive reading you could call it a fluency class so you can do a, a english practice class whatever you want to call it but an extensive reading class is so powerful so typically in a class like this you have half the time for reading half the time for activities just in general there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, the second one, this is what most people end up doing because you, maybe you don't have the time or uh, to do this in your class. Also, it requires a lot of administrative support and, and advocacy to get that a class just for extensive reading. Okay, but the second one is incorporating extensive reading as a part of an existing class. So how can we bring, bring the books into your class? Three is out of class reading. Maybe for whatever reason, you're not allowed to do it in, in, the, in the classroom. This may be frustrating, but you can actually send books home with students. You can also assign different activities, could be writing activities, which can be done at home. And, and these things can actually come back and incorporate in class. When we get to the activities, you'll, you'll have some more ideas on how to do this. The fourth one is an actual an after-school class, extracurricular, or book book club. So this should just be outside of the program. Um, this also sometimes takes volunteer or just extra time as a teacher, which can be your valuable time. But there are a number of schools and programs that do these and can be very, very successful. Now, we're going to go into the mechanics exactly how to do it, okay? So this is a question that uh, I've worked with a lot of teachers on, and this is what we have found works very well. And specifically, we it appears that most of the people here are teaching in middle school or high school classes. Uh, we do have a number that are in dual immersion and in university classes, independent classes, and we have a few learners on here. So uh, take note and think about this specifically for your students on how this could be done. So the first step is that we find is that students, the first time reading a book, like they, it's scary. Like I've handed a student, a book to um, a student before. And I, and I know I'm like, I've spoken with them in Chinese. I've heard them re like just read paragraphs or sentences. I read them, handed them a book. I said, Hey, this is easy to read. And he looks at it. He's like, I can't read that. And so that is usually the first reaction. And I opened the book, said, no, just just try it here. Just try try the first page. Just just try reading. And when they start reading, they're like, oh, wait, maybe I can do this. OK, and assuming that they're appropriate level. So the first step is to help students ease into reading. And what we found is if you're in a classroom environment is read together as a class. Now, there's a couple ways to do this. Every student could have their own book. You can have a book that's on a projector. Well, if you're doing online class, it's a little bit hard sometimes to project that book over, uh, over the, uh, you know, over the the video call or something because you know we have students who are maybe not as engaged. Uh, you know your students better than I do, and sometimes you have to find out what works best. But you read this together. This gives you the opportunity to do guided reading, and you can stop and help students if they're having trouble or if there's a character they don't know. You can encourage students to read a paragraph. Uh, you don't force them. When students are ready, sometimes they'll volunteer and they'll want to read. And that's fantastic. Once you get through that first book, it gives them a little bit of confidence. And so now they're ready to do be a little more independent. Next step, step two, is reading in small groups. And what we've seen is that reading in groups of two to five. 
this works well. Students can help each other. You're always going to have a little bit of slightly different levels within that group. But if they're generally within the same level, then they're going to be able to help each other and support each other. Uh, let's focus them on reading, you know, at a time reading maybe 10 to 15 minutes or uh, focus on reading at least one chapter. Once students gain enough confidence and competency, then you want to move them to independent reading. And that, when you get kids ready to do independent reading, you've won. I'm telling you, it's just, it's, it's butter. It's smooth sailing. And as Grant Brown, have, we mentioned him earlier, once you've passed that second book, everything is smooth sailing. For the most part, you're on this implicit learning train that's just constantly picking up new things all the time. So there's so much that happens when you get here. And as soon as you get there, it's, it's, it's going, it'll, it just, things get so much better, so much better. Here's some do's and don'ts for extensive reading. Some very practical things. Okay. Do use graded readers. Don't use books for Chinese kids. Do let students choose what books they want to read. Don't turn it into studying and where you have to like, assign them specific books unless you have to, okay? Do guided reading until they're ready to read alone or they're reading in supported groups. Uh, don't force students to read books that are too hard. Help them study up to the level of the books. And we're going to get into this. You have a, we have problems in classrooms where we have many students at many different levels. I'm going to talk about this specifically in just a minute. Um, let's don't make students translate parts of the book and yeah, don't like take it up on there and have a paragraph and let's slow dissect dissect this chapter or this paragraph and we take like 20 minutes just to read a paragraph unless it's a point of discussion like we can talk about it, everyone can read it but we don't like you know turn into like a studying or a lesson okay uh we use activities to express what they learn or what they've read uh we don't take multiple weeks just to read one chapter Remember, we're going for extensive reading. We want input, comprehensible input. You want a lot of it. If we're, if we're taking two, three weeks to read one chapter, how much input are we really getting? Encourage students and provide support to students who are struggling. And avoid this uh, thinking of, we're too busy studying for the test. We don't have time to read. Well, I guarantee you, if students take time to read, they will do better on the test. We have a lot of experience doing that. One of the best correlations with test success is reading speed. And uh, I have, I've done present presentations specifically about the AP Chinese test. And this is a key thing. If students can read quickly, they, there are chances of actually like passing that test, not just like getting a three, but doing better. It's like exponentially higher. So here's a bit of an, uh, a concept, what I've done for a classroom. Um, so pretend that box there is just a classroom. And we have, uh, this is what you could possibly lay out for 30 students in a classroom. Now, this is different. Not everyone is going to be having classes. Uh, I understand we have a lot of people online. But you're looking at here is that you break up students into small groups. And every group can be reading a different book. They don't all have to read the same book. The main thing is that they're at the same level or similar level, and they're reading together at a book they want at their level. So what, what I've done is I say, here's the books. You know your general level, or here's the reading materials. Go pick a book you want to read, all right? And then you go find other people, everyone that's reading the same book, and you get in that group. You usually don't want to get over five people. I guess you can do six, but it just gets too much. And they take turns reading out loud. You, as a teacher, you facilitate this. You're not teaching anymore. You're just floating around the room like that little, little green line through there. You're going through all little groups, walking around. People always have questions. They say, you know, what does this mean? Or I don't quite understand this. Or what is happening here? Or they ask some question about culture. Why would they do this? Or what is this thing that they're talking about in the book? So you provide questions. You, you provide insights. And you ask them questions. You can challenge them. If you're familiar with the stories, it works really well, too. 
So everyone's reading different books at their own levels. Students help each other. And it's possible for all students to be independently reading at their own desks. So if you are getting to that level, if everyone's at that independent reading level, I mean, you could have the whole class of 30 students just reading to themselves at their desk. And it's awesome. It's so cool when you get there. Because think about this. Now you have times. Now we're going to address this specific question. All right, my class has students at many different levels. I have students who are advanced. Like they may be, if they took the AP Chinese test or the HSK3 test tomorrow, they pass, no problem. And I've got some students that they are so far behind. They only know like 50 characters. I encountered this when I've done a pilot class. So here's what you do. This is extensive reading is perfect for this. It's perfect, okay? What you do is all the students who can read they go off to read, okay? They get in their groups or independently and they start reading. For the low level students, you can do one of three things or you can do a, a mix of these things. So you get the low level students together in a group. You as a teacher, take that time to actually teach, okay? Maybe you're doing quizzes, you're, you're doing drills, you could be reading with them. You could try to find some very simple texts or you make up something, you could be doing some flashcard games. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to help them and give them individual attention, of, give it individual attention to the students. And BUN, this is being recorded, yes. And everyone will get a, a link after this um, webinar with a replay of this, okay? Um, so this is excellent. It gives you a lot of time to focus. You can take students. If you, depending on the, who the student and their level, you could actually pair them with a more advanced student or a student who's just a little better, who can help them maybe read or do some studying together. One thing I also did is that um, we had some students who were just like, they were, they needed significant help. Well, what happens during our reading time is they did coursework on Mandarin Matrix. So if you're doing Mandarin Matrix, great. If they have an, if you're doing another like online platform like the Genbang, or I know that there's other ones out there. We just had a computer and they sat down and says, you, you, you get, get with it. And the good thing is a lot of those have short readings and based on what they're reading and their stories that they're reading, even though they're short, we can still do activities. And we're going to get into that next is about the different types of activities you can do in the classroom. So the, this is excellent. It's student-centered, comprehensible student-centered input, okay? All right, so now this is activities. Now, um, basically, I'm going to talk about speaking and writing activities. But all the activities can be leveraged for listening, speaking, reading, and writing, okay? So the reading mainly comes from the stories. That's the comprehensible input. That's the reading that you're getting. When uh, else uh, how do you find good reading resources? Uh, I had one on the earlier uh, chapters, uh, earlier slides, but that's just about, um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, and so, and listening, of course, when we have discussion, that's going to be part of listening is going to be in there. So we're going to, we're going to kid this. And I know we're scheduled in 15 minutes, but we're going to go through these activities. These are fantastic activities. Okay. This activity is a speaking activity. It's called 432. If anyone knows who Paul Nation is, he's one of the most foremost researchers in, um, in vocabulary acquisition. So um, this is an activity he developed. Uh, learners, what happens is that you get all the students and you have uh, people that are A and B. So everyone is, you know, they pair up and you have a partner A and a partner B. So what happens is you give a topic. Now, this topic can be based on a book. It could be to actually baked on based on anything. If you down here, there's a link down here in the bottom, um, and I have a handout. Let me just go ahead and give you that handout right now. Okay, yeah. So these are discussion topics. You guys can uh, download that if you see the handout. Um, these are discussion topics uh, that you can use uh, for this for this game. And so what happens is first the partner speaks for four minutes. Partner A speaks to partner B for four minutes. And partner, partner B just listens. That's it. Then you switch partners. And again, partner A speaks to the new partner B. The same topic, same thing, repeats himself, but now he has three minutes to do it. Then you switch partners again. And partner A does repeats the exact same thing 
same topic, same everything, but now they have two minutes. And what they find out, what happens in this activity is that as the activity goes on, that the, as you see the quote here of Paul Nation, he says that speaking speed increases, hesitation decreases, and their grammar errors decrease. And they use more complex grammatical constructions in the, la in the last two minute uh, exercise than they did in the very first one. Um, so this is a very powerful activity. Lots of extensive reading programs use this all the time. It's very, very good. Okay, this is one I've done. I love this game. I love this one. It's give a gift. Okay, now we're reading a story. Now remember, this is the power of literature. That we have stories that students get engaged with. So what happens in this activity is that you pick a you pick a character in the book. Actually, you pick four characters. You could do five. And you put their name down, they write their name down, and then they say, what gift would you give to this character? And you write it down, and then why? And it's actually a pretty funny activity. When you do this in the classroom, you'll be very surprised that's the student's creativity. You know, like, oh, he deserves, you know, coal, or he deserves, you know, money, or he needs, I think one, somebody says, you know, he deserves to be hit or something for whatever reason. Uh, and it's a fun game. It's very easy to do. It's not a high level one. And what you do is students will actually start looking up words that they want to use because maybe they don't know the word for the gift. When they start looking up words by themselves, that's powerful because now they're doing it. It's self-directed. They're interested in, in finding out something new. Speaking, a flip grid activity. Flipgrid, if you guys haven't used this, it's, a, it's a Flipgrid can be a lot of fun, especially now. This is a great online activity. Um, so you can, in Flipgrid, you can record short videos uh, on a platform that, uh, and they can be shared with the class. So students will record, can record a 15 second to a five minute video on an assigned topics. And these can be topics about the book. So in that, the students can get creative. They can talk about um, you know, comments about the story. Um, and if you guys, and you'll be getting this presentation. In fact, I ha have that handout uh, still that uh, you, you can you can look at this. These are different topics and things that you can look at for uh, for 4321, or even these are topics that you can be related to the books and the stories that your students are reading. Um, and you can do Flipgrid videos about this. Now, it can be a lot of fun. Um, the students can comment on them. They can do reply videos. They can get creative. They can make costumes. They can make voices, all sorts of things. I've done this activity. It can be a lot of fun in the class with students. So Flipgrid is a great one. And you have the book as a source of conversation, the story. And they don't have to be reading the same story. It can be all different stories or it can be the same story. This one's simple. It's easy. Talk about the story and draw a picture. So these are kind of, you can do either way where you say, draw some pictures about the story and then write what it's about. Or you can say, write what is the story about and then draw a picture about whatever they wrote about. It's very simple, even for low level learners. And in fact, I did this activity in class uh, once and we had some high level learners that, yeah, or high level students that they wrote some, you know, a number of sentences. But I also had a student who was struggling and through the class, he had maybe picked up another 100 characters. He was catching up. And he wrote a good sentence. It was amazing. It was like the first handwritten sentence he'd really written. Now, these are, it was in a dual immersion program. So not all of you are doing handwriting. So you can do typing. That's totally fine. Um, so these are, these are some fun things that you can do. Speaking, predict the story. Now it looks like my screen is in the way. We'll move me down there. So uh, after finishing a story chapter, have the students think about what they think will happen next. This can be a classroom discussion. Um, you know, students can first say what just happened in their chapter, and then they can predict what's happening. You can do this in uh, even in the reading groups, okay? So if they have a group of two to five uh, students, you can have this to do this little activity in that group. And now see, again, this is powerful because now you have in small groups, uh, you have more chances and opportunities for students to speak. When you were in a whole class setting, 
only one person can be speaking at a time. So now if you do some activities like in smaller groups, then just people have a lot more opportunities to speak. So identify clues in the story, uh, share personal experiences and stories that could help predict what happened. So this helps them make inferences. It's easy exercise that can be done between chapters and keep students engaged in the book. Okay. All right, our next activity. I'm going to. All right, write a chapter. Guys, this is one of my absolute favorite activities. Um, so this is very powerful. All right. So usually you do this when a, you finish a book. Now, it, and it, ch it challenges students, and there's three main things behind this one. It's a creative writing exercise. So one is you can have them write an additional chapter to the book. So they say, all right, pretend the story goes on, and they keep writing more about it. Write just an additional chapter. Two, rewrite the ending. You didn't like how it ended? Rewrite something. You know, use your imagination. Or three, write a new story. Take a character in the book and use that as a basis of like a side tangent side tangent story. Uh, I have an, uh, an example here for a teacher who had sent me uh, something his class had done. Uh, it was writing a new story. There's a, a dog in the 60 year dream, one of our books, and their students, uh, like two students wrote this story and it's about a thousand characters long and they made all these illustrations and stuff. The Adventures of Xiao He, and it was pretty cute. Uh, and it ends up with uh, Xiao He getting cooked in a pot of cauldron. They, the kids were eating them because they were starving or something. <laughs> anyway, but it's kind of funny because kids get really involved in this. I once had a student, I mean, who was typing his story out, and he had hit 1,200 characters. You know, he's kind of like, hey, can I, can I keep writing? I'm like, please, just, yeah, sure, fine, write as much as you want. The kid wrote like two chapters. Um, and so, I mean, you tell me about another time when a student gets that engaged in something that they just want to keep writing in Chinese and it can be very, very powerful. I love this one. So if you're doing this, try not to set too much parameters on it. Just let them get creative. Now, I once were, it was something like in, uh, I forget the book, but all of a sudden aliens showed up and abducted him and he ended up, you know, like flying around in the universe or something in a spaceship. Okay. It was ridiculous, but it was funny. And he wrote a lot in Chinese. So just let them be creative and let them write. Pokemon cards. Oh, this was a fun activity. All right. So you take a, um, you take, now you can do this with Pokemon. There's Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh!, um, maybe there's another game in your area where everyone's playing it. It's good with for collectible carding card games. And usually the boys know this, but a lot of the girls will also be familiar with this. So you find some sort of template online of that card, print it off, and you say, take a character from the book and make them into a Pokemon character. So give them flavor text, uh, give them a power, uh, give them something so that they can... Uh, you know, let's give them some some sort of power. So they, they got creative. Well, I have Da Chungus. Um, and then I've got, uh, what was it? You got Xiao Ho. Uh, Ho Hong Ho. And then we have uh, Wang Zi. And then we had Xiao Ming. And we have, someone made Shrek. Shrek wasn't in the book, but whatever. He made a character. Okay. But they were writing in Chinese. And this is great for reluctant writers, uh, students who maybe even not that high level. They'll be interested in, in usually completing this. And it can be a lot of fun. Even those girls that maybe they're not as interested in maybe some of these games or whatever, they, they, it can be a lot of fun. Okay, this is uh, Diane Neubauer uh, just gave me this. And uh, Diane, if you're here, uh, you can speak. Oh, you are here, Diane, yes. Let me see, Diane. I'm going to see if you could uh, invite you to present this. Uh, so Diane recently did, and uh, I just sent her an invite. Diane, if you're listening, I can accept that, and you'll be online here. Uh, Diane recently did an online book reading course with uh, with a bunch with some students, and not an online book reading. It was a book reading club, and so they all read. Our my teacher is a Martian, and I'm not sure if she's going to be able to make it online. We'll see if she does. I'll just go ahead and send her one more invite. Okay, Diane's here. Diane, welcome. Can you hear us? Uh, 
Let's see, I think she's probably still figuring out some stuff. But um, after if several chapters, and she, she'll hopefully she'll be here in a second, but I'll just kind of keep going. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go to the next activity, and we'll come right back to this. If Diane pops in, we'll, we'll come right back to this. Hi, hey, Jared. It's, oh. Do you hear me yet? I can hear you now. Okay, I, Diane. I got right. the message to join in, and it, uh, it cut me out. Like, I didn't get in very fast. So. Okay, no problem. Well, if you can, if you are, you might be able to... Um, Put your turn your video on, but if not, that's okay. Go ahead. T tell us oh, about this okay. activity. Oh, hey, it worked. All oh, right, great. Okay. Diane, yeah, welcome. This, thank you. Um, this was really fun, and I've done this in different levels of classes, so you can scaffold it so you can help the whole class and kind of build on their one word or short phrase suggestions for topics to ask, or if they're more proficient, they can ask the whole question right off the bat with very little scaffolding. So you can really adjust this even for a beginning group. So I'm doing a book club with a 150 character book from Mandarin Companion now. And we had a blast with this where there are interesting people in the story and getting to imagine what they might be thinking and doing beyond what the book tells us was really fun. So that was, how we went with that. One of my students then changed his name in the corner of our the video window on our Zoom meeting because it was an online class. And um, it was super fun. Lots and lots of laughs for me as well as the teacher and really good. Uh, so Diane, uh, how someone, Julia here was asking like, how did you get, have the book so everyone read the same book? Yeah, we got them before we started the book club. So uh, in my classroom practice, I had students like that was their assigned text we didn't have a textbook we had readers that we used so they they had that as a requirement in the high school where i taught um, or the middle school when i taught there um, with this group it's online learners and they could choose to buy a paper copy or an ebook copy and so we all had those great so it's appears and i think in your instance the students were responsible for getting the book themselves right they were Okay, so I and I think that's one of the challenges for some teachers that you know not everyone maybe can do that you know um, yeah. but I think it, there's a lot of ways to do this. So you can get print books. Um, you can it's possible to even to buy the books and gift them to the students if they have an Amazon mm -hmm. account. But also OverDrive and uh, Level Chinese also have online reading platforms. Yeah, so. and Jared, we want to observe copyright, but I think you mentioned that it's okay for a teacher to read to a class from one copy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, feel right, feel free to read guys. Um, you know, the main thing is like, you know, copying stuff and sending it out, but there, there's still a lot of things that you can do. There's a lot of ways that you can do this. So, well, great. Well, Diane, thanks so much for just joining us and sharing this with us. Really appreciate it. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I had another activity. See, Diane sent me this probably just an hour before our presentation, and this is very similar. It's a press conference. So, it's similar in nature is that you uh, you assign students to represent characters from the book and you can have students prepare questions. And it's like, you know, you grill them about what happened or it, depending on the ending of the story, you could have some really funny questions or very interesting things. These all see one of the great things about these activities is that they can all be funny. They can be humorous. And when we get funny and humorous in Chinese, students stop thinking that they're speaking in Chinese. They get engaged, they have fun. And some of these classroom management problems that we have, they kind of fade away because they're getting engaged. 20 questions. This is another great one. So, oh, and real quick, I want to uh, ask uh, Ari Russell. She says about uh, when it comes to writing a chapter, is there a significant difference in learning if you were to type out a story or handwrite a story? I encourage. Uh, especially in writing a chapter, any of those are creative writing ex exercises, I encourage typing. I'm, I'm a big proponent of typing some programs. I understand you have to do handwriting, um, or maybe there are some teachers might be advocates of that. I think that's okay sometimes in dual immersion programs, but for the amount of practice it takes to fluently handwrite characters, you'd be the students would be better off just learning to type and taking all that time and practice towards, you know, studying or reading or doing other activities to be more helpful. It is helpful to learn how to write, but I don't advocate handwriting big, long stories. Uh, so 20 questions, simple thing. Uh, it says when all the students have read a story together or they know the story, uh, one, they pick a character, someone privately picks a character, sits in the, in the group or in front of the room, and the students ask questions, yes or no questions uh, about them. 
to try to figure out what character they are. Uh, this is a fantastic exercise. This is called an, an interactive story. You can do this online. Students can get very engaged in this. Uh, actually, I wish I had Diane here. She's done, Diane Neubauer, uh, she, uh, who just presented that uh, earlier activity. She has done a lot of this. But what you do, it's um, if anyone's familiar with uh, Choose Your Own Adventure Stories. So there's this program and a platform called Twine, twinery.org, and it's free. And you create an interactive story. And you can use a graded reader as the basis of this. So you can pick some point in the story at the beginning or wherever. And the example here is like based on Country of the Blind. Um, there's a, something happens in the story and you can type it out, but now you create choices for the reader. So you say, all right, what do you do? A, you throw rocks at the men, or B, you run off to the mountains, or C, you calm down and go back to the village. And Julia, yes, will be sharing this PPT with, uh, with everyone here and just, a, we'll be, we're approaching the end and we'll, we'll share this with everyone. You can download it. Um, so it, you, and then from there, you can create more and more stories. If you can see the little image down here in the bottom left-hand corner, um, you can create all sorts of like a web of stories that have them alternate endings and choices and decisions. And it can be really fun. The story, each individual part doesn't have to be very long. It could be just a couple sentences with more decisions. And once again, it gives a lot of opportunities for the student to be creative and think of different ways and they're trying to use all the vocabulary that they know to create the next step in the story and you can share these with students they can share them with each other and go through their own stories it can be a lot of fun podcast i do know so uh, one teacher who said his students did this just have a they can create a little podcast this may for a little bit older students um who may be interested in something like this you can also do this with videos you can create have them create videos uh, oh, Moses Wong says, oh, great, there is a Google extension does the same thing. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, they create a, just a topic. Talk about the story. Talk about the book. Talk about characters. All these things we're talking about, like topics and discussion things, create a podcast about it. It can be a lot of fun. Share it with other students. Uh, Zencaster.com is free for students who um, you know aren't going to be together in the same room. Uh, we're going to also just talk about culture here. Um, there are so many more activities. We're actually collecting some of these and we're creating a teacher's guide, but about culture. I'm just going to read a little bit of this here. So, uh, and this is an important thing for like AP Chinese. Uh, I remember one of the fellows, Chinese teachers said, I really want my students to read things that have a lot of Chinese culture information in. So it was a grant says there, are, well, these graded readers are set in China with Chinese characters and they have these settings and time periods that are filled with hooks that gets students interested in the culture and the history. You have a book that is so much more interesting and you can ask them, would you like to know more about this? All of a sudden you have students who are really willing to put in that extra effort to find out more about the world and around them and more about the Chinese world too. Graded readers spur interest in Chinese culture and customs. So one of the stories about this at Grant specifically, he told me is that, uh, now, I know that AP Chinese test was a little different this last year, uh, but the year, two years previous, um, the student wrote on his AP exam about uh, Guizhou. And he asked me, he says, well, how did you even know about Guizhou? We've never discussed that in class. And he says, oh, we read Country of the Blind, uh, Mang Ren Guo. And it was set in Guizhou and it said it was a really mountainous area. And I got interested in Guizhou and I started reading a lot about Guizhou. And so when it came to a time of to talk about something cultural or an area of China, he had a lot to talk about. So these are things, there's a lot of hooks in these graded readers that can get people interested in uh, culture and a lot of topics for discussion. Okay, Li Haining. Well, we'll, we'll I'll talk about it in just a moment. Well, one more thing too. I'm, oh, look, my head's right on that shirt. Okay, I'm not a girl though. All right, you incorporate memes. I'm going to give a little plug for our Mandarin Companion memes. Uh, we turn out memes every day. We've done, we've published about 200, over 250 memes, and we, we do a new meme every day. Uh, I do know some teachers that have used these at the beginning of every class period. They, students are excited to come to class to see what is today's meme. And uh, these are hilarious. 
well, mostly hilarious. I make pretty much all these memes, so I think I'm funny. Ha ha ha. But a lot of people do too. So you can find our memes on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, there's a link right down there at the bottom. We're at Mandarin underscore companion. Uh, a lot of students just love these. So they're not necessarily just about, they're not like teaching you Chinese. Although there's that one meme just right here. You see it's, you know, bag, rat, kangaroo. Woohoo. All right. Um, but they, they really provide a lot of empathy and humor to students and it, it gets them engaged. They, they seem to really like these. So, but there are so many more activities. I have just a list there. You can read through some of these, um, but there's so much that you can do. We are working on a teacher's guide that's going to be crammed full of these types of activities for students um, that you can use as a teacher. And it's also going to have a lot of the practical things and how you do extensive reading in the classroom. So, uh, again, this quote back from Grant Brown, he says, the students are not worrying so much about what to say. They know what to say. They're thinking about how to say it. It provides an environment where that really pushes the limit on what they're able to do with the language. So that is my presentation, guys. And we're going to ready to take some questions. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, and let's see here. Let's go through some of these questions that people have. And I'm going to be scrolling just a little bit. Um, so uh, Wen La Shi, she, he, she, I'm sorry, uh, says, uh, where do you find good reading resources? Um, well, I, like I had mentioned, I, we had a slide earlier just with a whole bunch of resources on it. Um, and uh, Diane had posted something. Let's see. Uh, maybe, uh, Han Xing, if you want to go through and like broadcast like uh, those links that Diane had shared about uh, easy to read things. Um, also, let's see. Uh, let's see. Zhang La Shi, Shi Sheng, Han Yu, Han Yu, Chong Xing Yu. Okay, let's see here. What else we got? Um, okay, Ari Russell talked about, uh, we talked about handwriting versus typing. Um, okay, Julia, how to make sure everyone has the book. We did talk about that. Uh, Indy Sally, we don't have a book club. You know, this might be something great, but I think Diane had formed one. I think it was something that Diane was doing specifically for her students. And uh, Zhang Lashi says, Ray Zhang says, how do you know the student's reading level to match the right books? Um, so Ray, one of the good uh, examples on this is just like a student is just, first off, always start easy. If you know a student is can read like at least our 300 level character books, um, but they're really slow, drop down. Like easy is good, okay? This is one of the things, remember if you go back to that reading exercise at the beginning at 98%, 95, 80% comprehension level reading, um, there you need to just start easy, but you just kind of try things. And if the student is not at the level of any of the materials you have, uh, you may need to just go back to some explicit instruction. Um, so this is one of the things that I've got to be honest, I am not an expert on taking a student from zero to like 20 miles an hour. Extensive reading is excellent at taking people from 20 to 60 miles an hour. And once they get on that thing, that they're they're just going. But you want to make sure that there's not a lot of unknown words that they uh, that they don't know. Lily Heining, Lee Heining says, uh, "Do you provide practices such as vocab comprehension questions after stories? Uh, there are discussion questions, at least in our books and in uh, Han Yufeng Chinese Breeze. Uh, so those can be used for discussion. Uh, usually, the comprehension check you just want them easy questions. It doesn't need to be a chore." It just is just a check to see that they actually read it, you know, and they'd be super easy questions. That's not the point. You want to get to these other activities that I've been talking about, other activities that that's going to get them speaking or writing or reading or listening. That's what you want to get to. So don't spend too much time on the comprehension questions. Focus on these activities. Okay, Peter says, in an extensive reading class where you start with absolute beginners, what stage do you usually bring in the first book? Uh, yeah, they're not ready for a book on day one. How do you, how do you usually ease them into it? So, uh, Peter Olson, uh, I recommend in that case, uh, you know, Terry Waltz, if you kind of, she has a lot of webinars now and she's excellent at working with beginner students and she has a whole thing, but mainly it's, you really want to get students very like familiar with language orally and then introduce them to the written and they start matching the sounds. She says, match a sound with a squiggle. Okay. 
uh, Lin Chang, uh, what's, what is the website of creating different stories that show on the one page? Hmm. Uh, I think you, maybe you're talking about twinery.org. So I'm going to uh, twine, I think might have been the, the thing that you were looking at. I'll just kind of back up to that. There's some creating interactive stories. Um, yeah, so maybe I think it was that. Okay, Wendy, she's saying, can you share some topics that you use for Flipgrid discuss discussions? So um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I should be more prepared for that. Um, but any of these topics that we're talking about, in effect, I shared earlier. Um, here, I'm just going to share. So I'm going to go ahead and share this presentation. You guys can start downloading this presentation. Um, and you can... On the earlier first slide, I talked about the 432 uh, activity. There's a link there to all sorts of topics. And you can use those topics. You can relate any of those to books where appropriate. And you can use those uh, for discussion. So uh, that sometimes, when, as a teacher, is like, I think it's some discussion questions. But when you have um, a book, it's so much easier to create the discussion topics. And at least in the Manor Companion books, in the back, you have... Um, a discussion questions that you can use. Okay, let's see here. Uh, okay, Yanjo, Mandarin Companion belongs to Mandarin Matrix. No, it does not. So we are separate. I know the guys. They're actually I'm in Utah, and they're based in Utah as well, and uh, we have a good relationship. But we are separate companies. Um. So Moses Wong says, hey, uh, hello. When you said don't make students translate part of the book while doing extensive reading, why is it? How do we check the comprehension or even assess the student on extensive reading? Thank you. So uh, Wang Lao Shi, I think, you know, when we get into it, I know, I understand. My kids, we're in Chinese school. I know translation has been a common thing for, you know, language education. Uh, it, it can have its place. Um, but a lot of the modern theory and most recent stuff doesn't really support that it's a very good for us, uh, you know, and really for language acquisition. So I'm not a huge advocate of it. You're going to get more mileage on just having a very simple comprehension check. All right. And here's the thing, too, is that they will, if they don't understand something, well, they just need to keep reading. Okay. I, I promise you, they may not understand it the first time, but they're going to encounter that same wording the same grammar pattern again and they will get it and if there comes a point where they're not don't understand they that's where you can step in as a teacher to help clarify or they say are there any problem they're kind of like slow or they're stuck somewhere that's where you can help help them out but as far as comprehension check that also comes out in the activities and if they're reading in class well something you can see in the reading um and so this is, we don't so focus big on like a lot of comprehension. You can do it and it is good just to check, you know, but don't spend a lot of time on it. Get, get it to activities. And I guarantee you when students get engaged with the story because they enjoy it and they like it, they will be, they'll be doing, they'll be more engaged. They're going to be reading. Okay, let's see here. Another one here. All right, so, um, okay, uh, Laila, she says, a private message, she says, thank you for the workshop. I feel excited to go back to school and work with my students. It'll be great if there's a teacher's reading club. Well, great, I appreciate that. I, I, this is going to be so helpful. Um, Laila, I think a big problem for teachers is time. Students don't have time to read after school for extended reading. That's great, yeah. You know, I know it's, it's Jane, it's, sometimes it just takes um, a shift, okay, in how you're thinking about your class. Like, can we incorporate a chapter, you know, in, into what you're doing? Uh, and, you know, you know your program better than I do, but I guarantee you that if you do incorporate extensive reading and you sacrifice somewhere else to bring the reading in, you will get accelerated results. I have never seen a program that incorporated extensive reading and did not have accelerated, uh, accelerated results, increased proficiency. So I, I just say, do it. Okay, how many years students need to learn Chinese before they start reading the Manor Companion books? Um, that really depends. Like I've seen some students who studied really hard and they were ready to read our breakthrough level in you know a few months. 
but that's outliers. That's not uh, normal. So uh, I think in Chinese classes, so like high school classes, our breakthrough level would be maybe end of year two or possibly beginning of year three. Okay. Um, in Grant Brown, the uh, teacher I've talked about a lot, his experience was that, um, here's Grant, if students can read uh, level, our level two books, they have no problem getting a four on the AP Chinese test. Okay. Uh, let's see, Kitty. Uh, she says, do you allow students to check online the meanings while reading? Well, sure. Um, if they need a lot of help, uh, they might be reading at too hard of a level. So you may need to drop down levels. Indy Sali, how do the levels of Mandarin Companion compare to Mandarin Matrix? If our kids are at Novice 3, what level of Mandarin Companion is appropriate? You know, I haven't done a good analysis on that. Um, I think largely at the... And I know that they've developed their levels over the last year and a half. I wish I had a clear answer for you. Um, but like I said, the breakthrough level is 150 character standard. In general, I think we did do some analysis a while back. And if they had gotten about 200 characters from Manor Matrix, they should definitely be at the 150 character uh, breakthrough level. Victor Bell, what do you think of level Chinese? Uh, Victor, is that you, one of the authors of Greater Readers? I, I'm not sure. No, Victor Bao, I think, is who it is. Um, what do you think of Level Chinese? Level Chinese has worked. I know Pauline Shun, uh, Shun and uh, I've worked with her closely on helping her get her things going uh, for, uh, uh, for Level Chinese. So I helped her conceptualize the actual the reading platform that they have. Um, I think we sometimes see a little bit differently on the reading standards that they have. Um, but our books are on their platform and um, they're good. So um, let's see here. Uh, Jing Li, can you please send the PPT link via registered attendee email, email to everyone? Uh, yes, I'm going to try to do that. I think we can send that out um, on the post, uh, the post game thing. Uh, Diane, she says, uh, okay. Oh, Hang Xing's back. Good. Let's we'll stop our slide presentation. Oh, and one thing I noticed here, the shirt here, we have merchandise too. A lot of kids like this. So it says, uh, uh, this one says, I don't give a shit, right? All right. It's, it's funny. Maybe not funny you Chinese teachers, but us language learners, it's funny. Okay. All right, Hong Xin, there you are. Let's see here. One. Uh, so we do have one teacher raised hand, um, but... And I raised it very early. I don't know what kind of question she has. So, so oh, that's yeah. right. Well, I'll, uh, we'll just I'll go ahead and click on her. Right, so that was quite a while ago. If you want to, you can yeah. come in here and ask a question. If anyone wants to ask a question or, or be on camera, you can ask. You can test to speak down over Reason. here. Reason. Uh, so we actually can put you on the speaker. Oh, good. Oh, and Victor Bell. Yes, it is you, the writer of your Chinese books. I do know your books. Yes, I have some of them. So, great. Moses Wong, it's funny. Yes, our books are funny. Um, and so, yeah, we, we specialize in humor, especially Chinese yeah. humor. Yeah, I think that's is very important, which is a, will give the hook for students to keep reading and keep uh, learning. That, that is very important. Uh, I just want to remind uh, all the other participants, uh, if you need to download a file, it's a, a good time to do that. To do, to do that. Uh, in the file parts, uh, there's a, the PPT and also the shared 100 topic. Uh, if you click on the, the top parts, there is a, the extensive reading activity handbook. Uh, so please uh, utilize those material and the resource we shared with you. It will be very helpful and uh, beneficial yes yes and if anyone is interested if you do um like i said there's a lot of greater readers out there i'm mandarin companion we do offer discounts to schools you can reach out to me directly um you can also find uh like our website uh, mandarincompanion.com there is a um a link there to uh order books and uh so you're welcome to fill out something there and i can give you guys a quote so there's a link right there so we're really happy to have so many teachers on here. And I tell you guys that I love, uh, I love what I do. We, I think the power of literature to help people learn a language, especially Chinese, is just, it's wonderful. 
and uh, and I love how impacting people's lives. Uh, like I said, we have a podcast, we have our greater readers, we have some fun merchandise and memes. So it's just here to support. A lot of what we do is free. The books, obviously, you know, we sell those, but uh, a lot of the other things we do is for free. And Carol B is just saying, is it possible to email the PPT? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to try to see if we can get that sent out. If you see over here, there should be this download uh, for the file. Uh, I have been sharing that. So if you want to look into the side about downloading the files, you can um, you can do that, download this presentation. Okay, well, great. Uh, uh, I think, uh, well, ha -ha. okay, Indy, thank you. Concur, the shirt's funny. Thank you. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> we have a lot more coming out. We have a bunch of t-shirts and stuff that are coming out. So we'll, those are fun for students. Yeah. Okay. So there's no questions. Okay, there's one doc in the file. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's one one document in the file, so it's a it's a it's a PDF. The presentation I've put into a PDF, and so you can download it. I do have some backup slides in there to, to discussing some other things. So please, a link for the company. All right, I'll send you our link right more and more time. So thank you there. So there is our company. I will actually I'll broadcast that one out. So there you go. If you want to check out our website, that's specifically if you want to like order any of our books, you can use that link and you can get our books. So. Okay. Great. <laughs> She's a Tang Lao Shi. I'm not a teacher, but you know, I, I, I've done teaching. I've taught, te taught Chinese. Yeah, but, you know, yeah you're hearing a knowledge, it's part of the teacher's job. So I guess that's <laughs> hard. <laughs> well, Hopefully, we're, and like I said, my what I've been working on is I've been writing a, a teacher's guide to extensive reading in Chinese, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope to get that published this year. Um, the good thing about it, it's going to be filled with activities. So it'll be what we talked about, have theory, practical, how to do it in the classroom, but it'll be have dozens of activities because that's what you need as a teacher. You need to like, when you leverage the power of literature in the class, Things happen, things change, and it's fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your time and uh, staying with on this presentation. And I hope you learned something and that's going to help you and your students. Yep. All right. Okay. All right. So I guess we'll end the presentation. You have anything else to say, uh, Yudasha? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so for me, I would just say, um, keep in touch. And so if there is a other um, workshop, uh, I will post it in the WeChat group. We have uh, information there. So keep in touch with uh, with everyone. Uh, it will be important. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. We'll do it again. <laughs>